Good afternoon. I'll try it again on this beautiful um, late May afternoon. Uh, I'm Eliza Bernard with the Norman Williams Public Library. And a uh, quick reminder to turn off or silence your cell phones and other distracting devices. I want to thank you all for coming out on this gorgeous afternoon. Um, we appreciate your support of library events, both your active participation and your generous uh, donations. And I do have a sign-up sheet for our newsletter, so you don't miss any of our other uh, things coming up. The Yankee Bookshop and I have been um, planning and plotting for the next several months. We've got some very exciting programs. I want to thank WCTV, who are once again filming the program. Uh, it will be available in a little while on their website and also on our ours if you want to share it with friends. And um, our format tonight's very simple. I'm going to do a brief introduction and then the uh, authors be speaking and uh, question and answer, and then uh, we'll open it up to the audience at the end. Uh, then there'll be uh, informal chat and book signing. Books are at the back table, and I think the author will stay up here to sign. So today we are going to be talking about natural magic, Emily Dickinson, Charles Darwin, and the dawn of modern science, which combines Rene Bourbon's scholarly research on Dickinson and her extensive background in, social, in science studies. In it, she draws intriguing parallels between Dickinson's poetry and Darwin's discovery at a time of great cultural shifts brought on by modern science. And for any of you who tuned into the um, Vermont Humanities uh, snapshot talk here last week, he was talking about how humanities and environmentalism have to come back together, and it's almost like there's a circle being formed in our understanding of um, environmental humanities. So um, it turns out that Renee Bertham hails from Hanover. She uh, commutes to Boston, where she teaches literature and writing at Simmons University, and she also holds a research appointment at Dartmouth. She's received a number of fellowships from organizations including the Fulbright Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, Arts and Humanities Research Council of the United Kingdom. And she's published other books including the uh, National Uncanny, Indian Ghosts and American Subjects, and Maria Mitchell and the Sexing of Silence, Science, an Astronomer Among American Romantics. Uh, her essays and reviews have appeared in American Literary History, ESQ, the National Hawthorne Review, and I could go on, but I'm not going to. She will be interviewed by Jack Sammons, who's the Griffin B. Bell Professor of Law Emeritus at Mercer University School of Law. Jack is the author of numerous publications, including books, articles, plays, poems, for which he's um, widely celebrated. Without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to you. All right, thank you so much. Thank all of you for coming. Uh, it's good to see you. And it's a, a great pleasure and an honor for me to interview my friend here, uh, Renee. Uh, just a little bit more uh, about the book that we've been talking about. So, what Renee has done is taking these two fascinating characters um, who are there at the beginning of modernity and place their lives in juxtaposition um, through biography and intellectual history and found great similarities. She does it for a very particular purpose. Um, what was happening at the time is that science and art were separating into separate disciplines part of the separation of what had been called natural philosophy, which was theology, um, philosophy, science, what we call science, all gathered together. They're all being divided out. And in this division, it's a division of nature and culture. Uh, nature is thought of as reality. And science is that thing which studies it and therefore tells us what's real. In the process of that, Renee examines what's lost when we do that. And many things go lost, the loss of the channel. Um, for her purposes, it's captured in the idea of natural magic. And I'll ask her 
many questions about what she means by natural magic uh, when we get there. One thing I want to say to you right up front is that because she's arguing in part, not just conceptually, but biographically, placing these two people together, it works on the reader consciously and subconsciously. You can no longer think of this as just an intellectual question. It becomes a question of these two people and how do I uh, relate to them. It's powerful. It's a, just a spectacular book. Uh, it has one serious drawback, and that is it is too generative. By which I mean that my friends and family are sick of hearing me talk about Emily and Charles as if they were this new young couple that I have met with terribly interesting. They don't want me talking about that anymore. Okay, so we're going to start with the obvious. Uh, you heard Renee's background. Given that background, it is no surprise at all that she would write a book about Emily Dickinson. The surprise would have been if she didn't write a book about Emily Dickinson. <coughs> but, Renee, Darwin? 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 Why? <laughs> Darwin, the great disenchanter, to write about Darwin in conjunction with her and enchantment. Uh, why Darwin? Why Darwin and Dickinson? It's a great question. Um, just to be clear, Charles Darwin never visited North America, and Emily Dickinson never left North America. So these are two people who never met each other. Um, so that's well, we want to be clear that although I'm talking about them together, they never met. Um, they did have common friends, and they had a lot of common interests, um, and. I would say that for me what happened was that I started reading Dickinson's poems and thinking about how Darwinian they were. Um, for example, um, there's one that starts, there is a flower that bees prefer and butterflies desire. And then as it, it's about the purple clover. And as it goes on to describe the purple clover, um, Dickinson describes clover and grass as struggling in a friendly, sweet way, as sweet litigants for life, she describes them. And when I read that, I was like, well, it almost sounds Darwinian. She's interested mm -hmm. in botany. She knows a lot about biology. But my preconception of Darwin, like mm -hmm. Jack's, I think, was came from Tennyson's poetry. And Tennyson said things like, nature red in tooth and claw. And that's how I imagined Dar Darwinian, the struggle for life, as something very brutal. Um, it was as I learned more about Darwin that I discovered that Darwin wrote about a brutal struggle for life, but he also <coughs> wrote about a sweet struggle for life. And that when Dickinson used sweetness, um, she was referring directly to Darwin. Mm -hmm. One of the things she said in a letter to a friend, she said, Darwin never told us um, why the sweet thief was part of life. Mm -hmm. And the sweet thief in that sentence is death. Um, but it's not the brutal, violent death. Mm -hmm. It's the sweet death. Um, once I realized that they had that connection, I started to look for other connections, and I found, as we'll discuss, mm -hmm. lots of mutual influences, lots of books that they both read, and even a few people who they both knew or corresponded with. So their connections were, were actually pretty close, although they never met. Yes, and um, well, as, as you know, the Tennyson quote is taken out of the context of the poem. Which, makes an entirely different point, but people only remember the red and tooth and claw. Um, I, well, I think it would be good at this point to go into some of those similarities that you found. And here's what I'm imagining. So Renee has had this brilliant idea to put these two people together and see what comes of it. 
And she starts doing, she knows Emily well, but she starts doing research on Darwin and she goes, oh my goodness, look at this. This is the same. In fact, in one picture that was taken, they're about the same age, they're, they are different time periods, even much older than she is, but when the pictures were taken about the same age, they look alike. <laughs> and I can imagine you, as you're working on this, saying, huh, I'm so confirmed <laughs> in my decision to pursue these two together. Is that how it was, what it was like, and what were the similarities that grabbed you? I think, yes, I love all the superficial ones. I love that when they were six years old, they both had sort of strawberry blonde hair and the same exact haircut. I <laughs> think that's really cool. Um, they look very similar. Um, I love that they both had Newfoundland dogs. Um, that they were very, very close to, and both of them attributed um, psychology, personality, soul to their dogs. I was really interested with that. I loved um, that they were both really, really strict about only wearing simple clothes. She only wore a white linen shift. He only wore a black lab coat. Um, but then, when they got when they got home, they both wrapped themselves in very similar paisley shawls. So I loved all that superficial stuff. Um, I also I wouldn't say that I loved the different ways that their reclusiveness have been remembered. Both of them were recluses. Both of them really avoided going out, they stayed home, they didn't want to do social things, they focused on work all of the time. Um, and for Darwin, that's always remembered as part of his being a great man. He was a great man, and so of course he didn't have time for all that superficial stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was introduced to Dickinson, her um, focus on work and her refusal to do a lot of social stuff was presented to me originally as if she was like really, really psychopathic or something, it literally seemed like a disease. Um, and so that's a similarity that I just found mm -hmm. myself sort of outraged by. Mm -hmm. Like, how can it be that you know, these two people working all the time on this incredibly important, generative, exciting work, um, and Darwin gets pure respect for that reclusiveness, whereas Dickinson gets labeled insane and it's mm -hmm. a lot of pity. Mm -hmm. So there's a something that's similar about them, mm -hmm. but that's very different. Now how about that? Uh, this was terribly interesting to me. How about the educational similarities despite the gender differences? So the educational similarities are not exactly what you would expect. Um, Charles Darwin trained for the priesthood at Cambridge University. Um, and one of the reasons that he did that was because at that time, when he was in school, in the um, late 1820s, you couldn't get a degree in the sciences at Cambridge. At Cambridge. You could take extracurricular science classes, which he was very interested in, but you could not receive a degree. So his formal education was in theology. Um, Dickinson, this is one of the places where she was luckier, I think. Darwin. She was born 20 years later, um, and after Darwin's, as Darwin's schooling was finishing, the study of science was becoming institutionalized. But it was still a little bit radical. It was still wasn't, I mean, if you really wanted to get a serious degree, you obviously would study classics, right? Mm -hmm. Because after you studied classics, you could enter the priesthood, or you could become a lawyer or a politician. You could be in public life after you studied the classics. Um, nobody quite knew what to do with science in this pre-industrial age. Mm -hmm. And so it was the perfect thing for working class folks and for women to study. It, in Massachusetts, where Dickinson was, it was um, girls who were encouraged to study the sciences and not boys. And so therefore, Dickinson had a very, very rigorous scientific education, both in Amherst and at Mount Holyoke, where um, she actually went to college for science, um, something that Darwin did not do. Yeah. I, I, I want these folks to hear your voice, too. So 
Well, we're wrapping them at that point in their development, their education and development. Would you mind reading the section on Darwin's development? It says on page 193, which I think is just beautifully done. Thank you. Um, yes, so this, um, this chapter is called The Slow Sailing Ship. Um, and it's about the time in Darwin's life um, when he'd been home for about 10 years from his great voyage. And he published, in that 10 years, he published five books um, about the voyage of the Beagle. Um, but he hadn't done anything in biology, and his great idea from the voyage of the Beagle was this idea of natural selection. Um, in order to write about natural selection, he needed to establish his credentials and his expertise as a biologist. He looked through the few specimens that had not yet been described, searching for a species that he could truly master. When he noticed a tiny, mysterious animal that he had collected almost 10 years before on an island off the coast of southern Chile, he got excited. Darwin had picked up a conch shell perforated with oar holes in 1835 as he strolled along the beach at Lowe's Ark Harbor in the Conos Archipelago. It was one of the most beautiful places he'd ever been. The view of the Cordillera Mountains in the distance may have made him feel as if he were walking in Humboldt's footsteps. In his diary, he wrote, I cannot imagine a more beautiful scene than the snowy cones of the Cordilleras seen over an island sea of glass. The shell he carried back aboard the Beagle was more peculiar than beautiful. He wondered what sort of an animal could have made the holes. When he caught it under the microscope, he was amazed. The minute creature, he described it as an ill-formed monster, looked exactly like a barnacle and cemented itself into the base of the hull like a barnacle, but it had no shell of its own. At the time, zoologists agreed that all barnacles had shells. If this animal was a barnacle, the entire taxonomy of Cirripedia, the barnacle group, would need to be reconceived. Darwin stored the conch shell and all its tiny residents in a jar of spirits of wine. Along with his ever-expanding collection, it traveled around the world with him, back to England, and eventually to his study at Downhouse. In the autumn of 1846, after he'd completed geological observations on South America, the third and final volume on the geology of the Beagle Voyage, he pulled the jar from its shelf. The view from Darwin's windows out across the flat, choppy landscape of Kent was very different from the view of the mountains from Lowe's Harbor. The low angle northern sun illuminated the gold colored spirits of wine in the large glass jar. There was beauty in its glow, but it was on a very different scale from the bright sun and the glassy sea of the South American beach. In one of her poems about the Cordillera Mountains, Emily Dickinson wrote, we see comparatively the thing so towering high we could not grasp its segment unaided yesterday, this morning's finer verdict makes scarcely worth the toil. A furrow, our Cordillera, our Apennine, a knoll. For Darwin, the scales were about to shift in the opposite direction, from small to large. The ill-formed Mars monster that he had plucked from the beach below the Cordillera Mountains was smaller than the head of a pin. A decade later, it would turn out to have giant implications. Mm -hmm. Now, I just have to Very show nice. you. Here's a picture of the barnacle, which I think was one of the hardest illustrations to get. Um, but it's actually Darwin's, Darwin's barnacle from his book on the Syracuse. So, I wonder about the same time period when Darwin is going through this youthful development. Um, Italy is cautiously emerging as a poet. Uh, about the same time period, same age, cautiously emerging as a poet. And uh, they are both uh, writing and thinking about nature. Um, much more than that in this case, especially, but, but nature, nature is the focus. 
But I want to ask you about this nature. Um, you, you, you have what you call a reimagined Darwin, and uh, we'll talk about him. We'll challenge you a little bit uh, about the reimagination of Darwin, peaceful Darwin, that you introduce us to. Uh, Emily's relationship with nature is, is fabulous. Uh, she takes on the persona of creatures. Uh, she writes about what is it like to be a blade of grass. Um, she lets nature speak, in a sense, uh, by her, what he would call her negative capability. She, she almost removes herself. Both of them attack the binaries that in framework, and by that I mean uh, human, non-human, that, that's, that's not a clear vision for either one. Uh, uh, animal, plant, Darwin goes after that. And she does too, in her own way. Um, even subject, object, especially for her. Okay, so uh, that's, that's lovely. And it's lovely conceptions of nature that, that you have been coming up with. I want to ask you now, though, about Emily's nature. Uh, nature her experience in nature is her backyard in the garden. Um, yes, she talks about volcanoes in Italy having personality and thinking and having emotions and flight. But her own experience is backyard in the garden, walks with Carlos the dog, maybe an occasional trip out to a bog to find a lady slipper. It's very, very limited. And in this small world, nature, birds, its bees, its plants, its flowers, its an occasional worm, maybe a snake. Um, the worst thing that ever happens is that a bird will chomp a worm in two, and as she says, eat the fellow raw, right? Or that one time uh, nature in early frost kills a, a flowering plant. So those are the worst things that happen. This is a long way from Tennyson, for sure, uh, but it's a long way from what others would think of nature. In over 2,000 poems, there is one elephant, one rhinoceros, and four monkeys, and that's it. Uh, is that nature? And is it a nature from which we can draw the sort of conclusions that or find the sort of implications that you do? Or is it an essentialism there? Is it inherent, perhaps, essentialism there in our understanding of nature that make it difficult to, to generalize from? So you're right that um, she didn't travel very much. She went to D.C., she went to Philadelphia. Um, Boston. But yeah, Boston, of course. But when she was doing that kind of travel, she may not have spent a lot of time outdoors. Mm -hmm. So the outdoor world that she knew was all around Amherst, Massachusetts. You're right about that. Um, I would argue, though, that um, to describe that as a small world mm -hmm. is, is a terrible mistake. Okay. Um, I would argue that in Amherst, Massachusetts, in the 1840s, mm -hmm. um, was a hub of scientific inquiry. And the, the man, Edward Hitchcock, who was the president of Amherst at the time, and who organized um, the curricula at both of her schools, Amherst Academy and Mount Holyoke, um, was an eminent geologist. Um, and her neighbor was an astronomer. The reason I'm talking about geology and astronomy is because I think that's what makes Amherst so big. Mm -hmm. um, she had a sense of Amherst um, in relation to the, the outer cosmos, in relation to the stars. She was educated in astronomy. Um, and even more than that, she was educated in geology. Um, Hitchcock was most famous for discovering the dinosaur footprints which he thought of as the tracks of a sandstone bird. Um, and that's Hitchcock, her teacher's um, connection to Darwin, is that Darwin wrote Hitchcock a letter admiring the, the, um, the bird tracks. 
Um, but Dickinson herself, when she wanted to dis define poetry, she said, this is a poet. It is that distills amazing sense from the familiar species perished by the door. Mm -hmm. What she was talking about with the familiar species perished by the door mm -hmm. was the fact that the doorsteps in the houses of Amherst had fossil footprints mm -hmm. in them. They were full of fossil footprints. Mm -hmm. And what she was able to find in those footprints, right by the, right by the front door of her house, those, the front door of footprints, um, was amazing sense. I love that word combination, right? Because there's reason, it's sensible, there's sense, and there's also wonder, it's amazing, mm -hmm. right? And a poet is the one who can distill that amazing sense mm -hmm. um, from that sense of deep time, from that sense of thousands of years of history right at the door mm -hmm. in Amherst. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I don't think it's a small world. Well, I, I'm, I'm with you uh, on all of that. Um, and perhaps at some point we can talk about um, Higgins and how he, he was a good friend of hers. Tom Lentworth. Tom Lentworth. Yeah. And he was a friend of Emily's, but he was also a friend of Darwin. And so sort of like a connection between the two going back and forth. And not, uh, another expansive part of her world is that that Darwin and uh, Dickinson were subject to uh, same influences, the intellectual influences, and we can talk about that a bit. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave this alone, but her idea of nature seems to be small. And it is a, um, as Latour would say, it's a, it's a non-social nature. It's not nature connected to us. Uh, she never talks about the things that we eat. Um, he doesn't either, but yeah. So in, in that way, it may be puzzled about the nature. But, but. Yeah, I think she's a little more abstract. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I they both are. They're both abstract thinkers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's um, go on and maybe it would be good to at least mention some of those influences uh, that they share. Um, there are too many here. Lyell, who, um, Lyell the small steps over long periods of time, how changes occur. Uh, Humboldt, the, one of the world's most interesting men. Uh, and he was the one, the web of life, uh, the way we think when we think of Gaia, that really comes out of Humboldt. And there's then, well, there's a bunch. Uh, Malthus, Lamar, Herschel, Hitchcock, Thoreau, Emerson Browning. She covers all of these. Uh, and they all are, are terribly interesting. And uh, the humble one grabbed me, and I had to pursue it. So I went reading it about humble. Which ones grabbed you? Which ones do you think were the most important shared influences on them? Uh, well, you're right about humble. Humble's very important. Um, I can um, combine them just by reading what Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote to describe Humboldt. Um, he said, Humboldt was one of those wonders of the world, like Aristotle, like Julius Caesar, like the admirable Crichton, who appeared from time to time as if to show us the possibilities of the human mind, the force and range of the faculties. A universal man, not only possessed of great particular talents, but they were symmetrical. His parts were well put together. As we know, a man's natural powers are often a sort of committee that slowly, one at a time, give their attention and action. But Humboldt's were all united, one electric chain, so that a university, a whole French academy, traveled in his shoes. I love that description. Um, yes. He was amazing, and he was a best-selling author of, and a, just a fantastic explorer. Um, and I would love to say that when Dickinson talks about the Cordillera Mountains or Tenerife or the Timberoso or all of her geographical references, that she's referencing Darwin because he went to those places and he wrote about them, all of those places mm -hmm. on his journey. But he went to those places because he was such a humble man. 
Yeah. Um, and when he spent his time in college, he was reading Humboldt's, Humboldt's narrative of his journey through South America, and then he would go and sit in the greenhouse and look at the tropical plants and just just dream of getting to getting to travel where Humboldt had. Yes. So he was totally influenced by Humboldt, and we know that Dickinson was influenced by Humboldt too, and also Darwin. Yeah. But but. The Humboldt came first. I want to suggest that the best of Darwin comes from Humboldt. Yeah, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. He, he, he adored Humboldt. Yeah. Um, I think the other one that I was excited about was Harry Hornell, um, oh, yeah. who introduced Darwin to Malthus's um, demographic theories, and so she was important for Darwin in that way. Um, but also, um, she went to Amherst in the 1840s um, and went to the college, and while she was at the college, she attended a geology lecture, and she saw all the benches filled with schoolgirls from Amherst Academy, and she wrote about that in her book. She was thrilled to see girls studying geology at Amherst College. Um, there's no reason to think that Emily Dickinson was in the classroom that day, and we, we, know, we can't say that for sure, but we can say that Martineau remarked on girls studying geology at Amherst, and that at one point in time, Dickinson would have been one of those girls. Let me, let me use Martineau's introduction of Malthus um, to, uh, to Darwin to get to what may be the elephant in the room, and that is Darwinianism, um, or Darwinism. So Malthus, as Renee was saying, has this theory and it is that population grow exponentially, but uh, food grows linearly. So in any population, there will be inevitable competition for survival for food. That's where Darwin gets the idea that becomes the phrase, it's not his phrase, but I mean, uh, the survival of the fittest. He needed to know what was a motivating force for evolution and he uses Malthus. Well, Malthus was completely wrong. His mathematics were wrong. He, he, you know, if, if uh, uh, people had been careful at all in reading him, they would have seen that it's not hard to see. Uh, if he had been true, we probably, most of us would not be here. <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was way off. Uh, but uh, Darwin used it. And Darwin became known as the natural selection guy, and that became known as survival of the fittest. And from that comes the idea of we are in this ontology of violence that we all live in. She has convinced me that uh, given the moral limitation of his species, which is that he is a 19th century aristocratic British intellectual, um, that he's a nice man. He's a very nice man. He's honest. Uh, he is humble. I'm more than willing to give credit to all of those that came before him, as he should have. Um, and that Renee's image of Darwin is true to the man and would be exactly what he would want people to be saying about him. So you've done him an enormous service. But there's this other side. It is Darwinism, uh, for which we can thank uh, for social Darwinism, for eugenics, which unfortunately at one point uh, Darwin actually encouraged, I think it was his brother-in-law that was doing eugenics. It, it, goes from there to Germany and then to Nazis and then to the extermination of Jews, uh, corruption of the blood, the line that you now hear, uh, that comes out of uh, Darwinism, comes out of eugenics. Uh, Adam Smith, the great economist, Scottish economist, had an influence on Darwin. Darwin's influence on the thinking of Adam Smith would horrify, or Darwinism's influence would horrify Adam Smith. The most corrupted forms of capitalism uh, come out of that. And the hardest thing, and the hardest thing to reconcile with 
with what Virginia is saying is that for many people, they think that Darwin is the great disenchanter, that he reduces everything. He's a reductionist. He reduces everything to one theory. It's like Plato's theory of forms. It, it's a theory of to explain everything. It's a general law that explains everything, a general law in which the individuals get lost along the way. Um, so let's take that, take what Rene said a few minutes ago, that these are people, both in Lee and Charles, who wanted to avoid the public, wanted to avoid confrontation. I didn't like it. Um, uh, almost to an extreme, didn't like it. Can we then blame this nice fellow Darwin for Darwinism for not speaking up strongly enough against what he saw, and he did say that was happening to his theory? Why don't you blame him? Why don't I blame Darwin uh, for Darwinism? Um, George Bernard Shaw said um, that. Charles Darwin was never for one moment a Darwinist. I thought that that's so interesting. It's like, Darwin was not a Darwinist. Um, and I think when Shaw said that, he was imagining Darwinism the way you described it, right? He was imagining a social Darwinism that's about brutal struggle, winner take all. Um, Darwin was not a social Darwinist. He also, though, wasn't, there's another strain of Darwinism that people describe as reform Darwinism, which is the friendly Darwinism, where it's collaboration and ecology and networks that are tangled together, and, um, where the, the way that the clover survives is by being beautiful and smelling good. So there's a flower that bees prefer and butterflies desire. Yes, it's a struggle, but it's a struggle to be more beautiful. Um, that's more the reform Darwinism side. Mm -hmm. um, Darwin was also not a reform Darwinist. Um, <coughs> okay. Instead, he was trying as hard as he could to be what he called perfectly disinterested um, and to stay above the fray. Mm -hmm. um, when he asked for representatives to to talk about on the origin of species, he got one very religious um, evangelical Christian from America. He got um, an Anglican man, a botanist who was Anglican hooker, who always, always divided science and religion. Mm -hmm. um, and then he got um, Huxley, who invented agnosticism and who celebrated draft mm -hmm. And he asked all three to be his spokespeople. Yes. Um, so he was very consciously like, not choosing any of them. When the World Congress of Atheists met in England and um, invited, um, asked if they could come and see Darwin, he said, yes, you're welcome. The atheists are welcome to come see me. And then he invited the vicar, too, just to balance it out. So every single time, he tried to balance. Jack's question is, can we, can we or should we blame him for not picking a side, right? It's kind of a both sidesism that he did. Cool. <laughs> It would be for more vigorously opposing the what you see as a misapplication of his own thinking in very pernicious ways. He wrote letters to friends that was private. Right. And I think it was almost cowardly of him not to do it. The comparison would be Einstein, of course. And so Einstein said that if he had known the Adam Bomb would be the product of his work, he would never have done it. And he zealously opposed the bomb. Right. Shouldn't we have expected Charles to do the same when he saw eugenics? When he saw there was a lot of good use, I don't want to say it was all bad, there was good use of Darwin, especially in the States, in regards to slavery. Because his point is that we are all of the same species that all of us are entitled to moral agency as human beings. Yes, and um, he was thrilled by the anti-racist, abolitionist yeah. uses of Darwinism, but he also didn't go public about that. He really yeah. didn't, he, he kept it very private. I know, I don't want to blame him for staying so private. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, yeah, I, I can see that. I think that I come to the privacy question, um, as I said at the beginning, wanting to sort of stick up for Dickinson's privacy. Yes. Um, and so if I'm going to do that, I think I feel that I just, in fairness, want to stick up for Darwin's privacy. Let me give you a way out. Okay. So Dickinson is excessively private, mm -hmm. right? And uh, she too wouldn't choose sides. The only thing she was clearly opposed to was slavery. And she, even her thoughts about the Civil War, or I don't know, sometimes this, sometimes that, her thoughts about Christianity, I don't know, <laughs> could be this, could be that, uh, on and on, right? She avoided the public. She avoided confrontation. Italy is an existentialist from the beginning. She wants to become, make herself into this persona who is the poet and has to be true to that. In order to be true to that, she has to avoid all of those things. They corrupt her language, I think. I'm not going to give him that excuse. What do you think? Okay, I can, I can see that. Um, she wants to be the poet. He does not particularly want to be the scientist. That's not a word that he uses. Um, he's more likely to say man of science or to say something like specific um, naturalist or something like that. So he doesn't necessarily have that, that ideal of scientist the way she does as a poet. Um, I also think, though, that he was a humble person, yes. and he was genuinely not sure. Um, Charles and his wife, Emma, um, argued and argued about, well, not argued, but discussed, over and round and round, about their children, who were just really nice kids. And um, Emma thought that the fact that their children were so kind and polite and considerate showed that there was a God, mm -hmm. right? That, mm -hmm. that God made these kids just naturally, naturally good. Mm -hmm. And Charles thought that the fact that they were so kind by nature showed that there was really no need for a God, right? <laughs> they were just born and good. Um, and but it also showed that people who weren't kind that there's something profoundly wrong with them. Right, right, exactly, <laughs> and that's what he thought. Um, but so they went round and round, and I don't think that he ever really decided what okay. he thought about that. We we are we have only a few minutes left, and uh, she and I can talk about this for days. Yes, we could. I, I'm sorry. Let me ask you one quick thing. And, you're the only person in the world to whom I can ask this question and it makes immediate sense. Why are there no Indian ghost in Emily Dickinson? Ah, uh, I've got an answer. <laughs> 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 so, my first book was about representations of Native American people as ghosts. Um, and Emily Dickinson does not represent Native American people as ghosts, although most people write what she did would love that metaphor and did all of them. But, in the first poem that she ever published, um, which is called Sick Transit Gloria Mundi, it was published um, in the early 1850s, and Dickinson was probably really upset. It seems like one of her friends sent it to the newspaper without asking her is probably what happened. Um, she never mentioned its publication. Um, but at the end of that poem, she says that at, at some point she's going to die as poets always do this, right? I'm going to die, but my poem will live on. The memory of my ashes will live on. And then she says, and farewell, Tuscarora, and farewell, sir, to be. Um, when she does that, it's one of her few references um, to Native people. Um, she's saying, I'm going to be extinct. And she's saying, yeah, Tuscarora is a tribe of Indians who are said to be extinct in the 1830s. And also, dear reader, farewell, sir, to thee. You're going to be extinct, too. Mm -hmm. um, and she's very clear that extinction is coming for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, 
but maybe not for the home, yeah. which is going to last yeah. beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you for questions. There's so much we didn't get to, including the question of what is natural magic. So I hope people <laughs> might pick that up. Uh, in some ways, it is uh, the imminent mystery in which we all live, but she has something much more specific in mind. It's the hiddenness behind things, uh, the presence of absence, as Heidegger would um, say. We didn't get to talk about that. We didn't get to talk about the theologies of these two people, who are very, very interesting in their differences, and uh, so much more. Um, but we're going to turn it over to you, and before we do, I wanted to read one thing. This is a book in which Rene is trying to convince us to re-enchant the world, that by visiting these two people and their struggle against disenchantment, despite what many people think about Dar, their struggle as she sees it against disenchantment, by returning to these people, their world can reemerge for us, and we can apply it in our time and learn how to combine these two to live poetically and, and, uh, and, and to dwell poetically in our world. So it is, it ends on a very positive note, um, an uplifting. And I wanted to end our section of this with uh, a poem. It is one that uh, Renee uses, but she in the book for another purposes, but I think it applies to our experience as readers of her work. Exhilaration, because it is exhilarating from the workplace. Exhilaration is the breeze that lifts us from the ground and leaves us in another place whose statement is not found, returns us not, but after time, we soberly descend a little newer for the term upon enchanted ground. So thank you for writing. Oh, thank you so much.